Ryan here, aka Mac, and welcome. The monthly reports are now out, so let us kick it off with the Squadron 42 monthly report. As always, a huge thank you to all of my patrons and channel members. Thank you guys so much for the support, it is truly appreciated. And if you do enjoy my content, please do consider subscribing and helping the channel to grow. So beginning with the AI content team, they began the month taking the AI behaviours from test levels and adding them into Squadron 42 locations. The deck crew wildline development progressed as well, with devs taking placeholder dialogue and implementing it into the behaviour. And the team also gained the ability to trigger wildlines when an NPC enters a usable. So for example, an engineer might say, let's see if we can fix this, as they inspect a damaged pipe. And no, they, they for some reason didn't ask me to do the voices. The next step is to have the AI react audibly if a ship returns to the hangar without a wing or with heavy damage. So a nice little touch just to feel like characters are reacting to you uh, and the environment. Now the team has enabled deck crew and utility AI behaviours to push movable consoles and trolleys around the hangar. This they say adds more variety to the background and makes the location feel more distinctive. Hopefully they will show us this deck crew getting on with their stuff. It would be good if they could just show us like a full setup of the AI in the background just doing what they need to do as I don't feel that would spoil too much and it would be a good way of showing off what the AI can do maybe. Now the team also implemented 25 different walk styles for all of the procedurally generated characters which have randomized faces and bodies. Now this they say led to a significant visual improvement as approximately 70% of the game's population now walk and run with varying style and speed. Very happy to hear that they've done this. Having that variation will be very nice to see and it was mentioned by Chris Roberts years ago during a 10 for the chairman that one day he would like players to have the ability to choose their walk style for the verse. Obviously this is not required anytime soon for the PU but maybe with the work being done for Squadron this could transition over to the Persistent Universe one day soon as well. Finally, the AI content team also progressed with several other features currently in development, including the eat and drink behavior. This will allow NPCs to obtain sustenance from usables, such as the chow line, which will be in the mess hall, or vending machines. The leisure behavior progressed as well, which controls how NPCs spend their downtime, for example, playing arcade machines, talking with each other in the mess hall, or relaxing in their bunk watching TV. When we get some sort of off-duty time in Squadron 42, like in between missions, I am going to be wandering those halls, talking to everybody. Now for the AI feature team, they continued working on the Vandal AI, playtesting the first encounter to tighten up the gameplay experience. They then focused on the player shooting down Vandal waves before they reach close combat range, with ranged enemies providing covering fire, with the team saying, Having a lot of the main building blocks in place is allowing us to focus on different encounters, making sure that we are addressing not only the technical implementation, but also the fun elements of the game. Cannot wait to see the Vanduul and how they fight. I'm glad that they are keeping them behind closed doors because, you know, when we last saw them, they looked quite impressive. So from there to what they'll be like now will be quite night and day, I suspect. And also, I hope they make them quite challenging and very scary for when we do encounter them for the first time, building on that suspense. That'll be kind of cool. Now, on the human combat side, the team wrapped up support for AI reactions to dead bodies and continued to implement their tactic-based combat design. And as many technical pieces now work reliably, the designers can dictate time to polish and tweak tactics with the current focus on three main roles being the defender, the pusher, and the flanker. And I'm certain that most, if not all, of this AI work will transition over to the PU, not just for players to fight against, but also when the time comes for players to hire NPCs and how adept each NPC is at their role, dictating their payment price. Now, moving on to AI tech, they addressed feedback on the initial implementation of the planetary navigation tech, which was then passed on to several teams for use in various scenarios. So it sounds like it's progressing. One improvement is the addition of a priority manager to help calculate which areas require navigation mesh regeneration with the position of players, NPCs, and vehicles 
currently used to determine where the nav mesh is required. So yeah, very happy to hear that they are making further progress with the nav mesh. Of course, it's going to be useful and needed for Squadron 42, but it will be very great when they get to the stage to begin implementing it into the PU, as this does open up a lot more new functionality for missions, locations, and things that will directly affect the player and provide more gameplay for us. Now, to enable the designers to request realistic NPC reinforcements on planets via spaceships, the team began developing functionality to allow NPC pilots to spawn and adjust the dynamic landing and takeoff splines. They also improved the spline creation process for smoother landings and takeoffs and adjusted the tactical point system queries to work on planets and find the point where NPCs will move to as they disembark, with simple behaviours implemented to showcase this new feature. Again, once this ability, or once all of these abilities are working in Squadron 42, and the bugs and edge cases are ironed out, it will be adapted to work in the PU, and having NPCs capable of landing and taking off will be very necessary for the economy, for NPCs coming and going from landing zones, delivering goods, transporting players, bringing reinforcements to come to a player's aid or fight against the player. So much functionality that this allows and combined with the nav mesh, combined with all this other stuff we're talking about, it is going to be such a big influence. Now, the development of technology allowing NPCs to correctly push and operate movable entities like trolleys continued. They also added further improvements for locomotion and grip posing on trolleys with different layouts and began implementing parking spots for movable objects. Also, several improvements and fixes were implemented into the Subsumption Editor tool, including a full graph map of outlier behaviors, visual grid and snap functionality, the ability to quickly insert nodes at the mouse cursor position and an easier way to drop connections from a node. And finally, for the AI tech team, they continued to refactor the NPC movement request system to allow for more consistent synchronization of states between server and client and to unify the way NPC movements are processed to reduce inconsistencies. So moving on to the AI vehicle features team, they worked alongside AI on behaviors that will benefit both the PU and Squadron 42, with the aim to improve flight behaviours to be more dynamic and closer to how human players behave in combat, plus they focused on a ship tactic for fighters taking on capital ships. It will be interesting to see if CIG can make AI more human-like. In most games, you can clearly tell a player from an AI, so it would be cool one day if they can get to the point where it is much harder to tell and players can blend in with the population without being so easy to spot. Now, the animation team worked on zero-g movement, helmet equipping, standing at and using tables, work zones, blockouts for Big Benny's noodles, tactile chair animations, vandal combat consoles, and cowering and surrender. So, quite a few then. They also set up work for female spec ops development, progressed with generic enter and exit improvements to help streamline the development of AI usables and worked through the second pass finalization for the story cast characters. Now for the environment art team, they continue to work on three key chapters alongside design while R&D and large asset passes on several late game chapters began. Finally, the environment art team worked to create an appropriate sense of scale for the overworld spacescapes. Now, for cinematics, they predominantly worked on three chapters, the first featuring the Archon mining facility, the second consisting of FPS sections on a planet, and the third being the opening chapter. So for the Archon mining facility, they further developed the tram system used in several sequences, and with the station being eight kilometers in length, which has grown since we last heard, the player will use the tram to progress. The team are currently working out how to get impulses from the tram's exterior to transfer to the physicalized entities and actors inside, so it sounds like something may happen during one of these trips to cause it to rock somewhat. Plus, the team also prototyped a scene involving a mining tick landing and then walking into the main hangar to be unloaded to a cargo train. That is going to look pretty phenomenal. I really hope that these Sidness mining ticks will be available in the PU one day. I can't imagine they wouldn't release them to the PU after Squadron's released. It would be such a waste. Now, for the planet side FPS section, this is actually an older scene shown during the vertical slice, which was further polished, receiving improved animations, cameras, and player inclusion. 
And for this opening chapter, the team created splines for fighters, capital ships, the player hub ship, and more. They also further expanded the Vandal fleet with newly created ship types and are currently progressing with the remaining battle sequence. Finally, they also added more hangar activity scenes that occur before a large battle. So new Vandal ships, I do wonder what these will be and whether Esperia will get to recreate them for human use. Man, I can't wait to see Squadron. It sounds like they're really holding off some stuff to have more of an impact and a surprise for players. Now, moving on to gameplay features, they progressed with object container streaming overrides with the aim to get an example use case into the game. They also worked on a weapon kiosk screen for the Master at Arms, where players can see what weapons, attachments and grenades are available, along with descriptions and statistics. And then from there, players can ask the Master at Arms to provide them weapons to try out in the firing range, or have them delivered to their weapon locker for use in the next mission. This sounds really cool. I'm glad that they're incorporating the use of a kiosk, but also it sounds like they are sticking with the face-to-face -face interaction option with the Master at Arms, as that seems like such a cool part of being on board the Idris, going and requesting a weapon, but also giving us the option to pick and choose what weapon and items we want based on their statistics and, and what we need for whatever mission is at hand. Now the gameplay story team progressed with some big ticket updates on complicated scenes it says and as part of this they polished a walk and talk scene in chapter 5, improved a major scene in chapter 12 and progressed with a complicated scene in chapter 14 involving a medical gurney. Oh god, push and pull items. We're certainly all doomed. Uh, the team continued to add new audio and facials to the random two NPC scenes. They delivered eight this month with only a couple remaining. And finally, a major scene in chapter five with multiple characters quickly boarding a tram was delivered before the team moved on to looking at how characters exit scenes early when the situation changes in game. Now on to the graphics and visual effects team. Last month they made updates to various shaders with submits for the per material auto C buffer layout and minor improvements for booleans as shader parameters. Not a clue what any of that means. For the ongoing Gen 12 transition, the team fixed various bugs such as shadow flickering, level of detail ratio issues caused by the porting of skinned meshes and multiple crash fixes. The team also continued with the Gen 12 scale form porting, making modifications to the execution order and interface to match the current behavior of RTTMs. And they also began on moving scattering query analytical shadows to Gen 12. So some nice progress there. Not really sure what all of that means, but I know a lot of it is for getting shadows converted to this new Gen 12 renderer, which should be a lot better than what they are now. Hopefully eradicating bugs, flickering and all, that, all those problems that we see in the verse. Now for Vulcan, minor changes were made to descriptor indexing for internal bugs, while fixes were made to a crash relating to headless client metric gathering and warnings updated for render doc. Not sure what render doc is, but again, happy to see updates with Vulcan, even if they are minor. It is definitely something that I'm looking forward to seeing implemented just to see what it can bring in terms of performance gains. Now, specifically for Squadron 42, fixes were implemented for gas cloud related bugs and the team continued to develop the retro reflective effect in layer blend. Now onto the level design team, the FPS team created the final gameplay implementation for several early chapters. Very happy to hear this team is working on their final implementation, that is great news. Work is currently ongoing, they say, on moving a number of mechanics and chapters towards alpha so they can begin testing and balancing gameplay. So quite impressive progress here. Getting it into an alpha state, which is probably more applicable to a single player game than what we have with the PU. Uh, the space and dogfighting team supported the other design teams in bringing early chapters to vertical slice quality. They also worked to finalize the size and gameplay locations in the Odin system now that the quantum travel and quantum boost mechanics are closer to final. I've been hearing a little bit about this quantum boost. I don't think we know exactly what it is yet. Have we been told? If we have, do drop me a link in the comments below where they tell us. But I'd love to hear more about this and what it does and how it's going to work. Finally, the social design team continued their long-term task of implementing all in-game scenes. 
Now, next we have the narrative team. It says they had several playthrough sessions with the design team to look closely at the moment to moment experiences of two specific levels. This part of the refinement process ensures that the player's motivations are clear, that the emotions and tone of the world are properly conveyed and allows the team to see if there are any further opportunities to create a more immersive experience. For example, to better highlight where a sniper was located, the team discussed a possible scene addition to draw the player's attention. So really great hearing that the narrative team are now playing through these scenes, which means the final setup look and feel must be pretty much done for these scenes if it's now just trying to highlight more of the lore of the verse, as that surely is the only way that the team, the narrative team, will be able to tell if it needs more or not. Uh, the team also began creating and implementing discoverable lore throughout the game to help players learn more about the narrative of the universe and provide further rewards for level exploration. And I am certainly going to be finding and reading everything. Now, finally, for narrative, the mocap sessions were concluded and selects were made to be processed for implementation. Now, on to the Q&A team. They continued to support cinematics by reproducing issues found during development and chasing up outstanding bugs. They also focused on AI bug validation and refactored the JIRA process to help organize existing and future tasks. The tech animation team spent the month iterating on their rework of the internal DNA system. This update, they say, will allow them to expand the gene pool used to create believable heads in-game and ultimately offer more variety to players. Where is my head? Damn it. Uh, the team also revisited several head assets requiring updates and in some cases a complete overhaul. The ongoing head scanning initiative is currently supplying the team with new archetypes that are being extracted and turned into full game-ready facial rigs. Oh, I hope they haven't gotten rid of my face. I have no reason to think they would, but then I've not heard or seen anything on it for so long. Finally, the tech animation team maintained the existing animation pipeline alongside spearheading initiatives to supersede older tech to expedite in-house workflows. Now, next up, we have the UI team. They worked on pre-production for a variety of scenes, including the layout and visuals of several interactive screens throughout the game. An improved concept for the door UI panels was signed off on as well. And the team also continued to update the design and look of the Moby Glass and star map to fit the feel and gameplay for Squadron 42. Now, I believe the Moby Glass is a similar to what we have now, but more specific and bespoke to Squadron, to the military, not just a civilian version of it. But I do hope we get to see current progress on the star map soon, as I am dying to see what it looks like and what new functionality it has. Maybe during an Inside Star Citizen Sprint Report next quarter, we could see this. Unless it's going to be close to ready for 318, we don't know. We haven't really seen much yet, uh, but that would be a big win, uh, but we'll see. Finally, the visor and lens were also set up to run in building blocks, which gives the team new optimizations and lays the groundwork for the actor feature team to add new features. So very nice to hear that that's progressing. It'll be so incredible to see the helmet visor set up in building blocks and be contextual to the helmet type. So military helmets having military visor hoods uh, and obviously things like mining helmets having mining specific hoods. Not that we'll see those in Squadron 42. I'm pretty sure it'll just be military helmets but seeing them power up power down as you're taking them off that interaction and immersion of putting a helmet on will feel so much better than what we have now now finally we have the visual effects team they completed an implementation pass on a key location which involved fully populating the location with representative effects that they will return to later to polish and fully optimize they also continue to fine-tune several important weapon effects, including rendering a new muzzle flash firing texture sequence from Houdini to help emphasize the weapon's power. Great progress was made, they say, on a key destruction sequence utilizing some clever simulation techniques to help give the appearance of metal bending and tearing rather than fracturing like a stone. And finally, the team continued to explore the options that the Montreal's Mighty Bridge Houdini interface offers. Whew, so there you have it. That is this month's Squadron 42 monthly report. It looks like AI is getting tons of work done to it, which I am very happy to see, as of course all of this will trickle into the PU when it's ready, and hopefully they can get the server to remain at a decent frame rate so we can actually see this in the verse 
and appreciate all the quality and time that is going into the AI. It also sounds like many areas of Squadron 42 are getting into the final stages of development and I'm expecting an update from CIG one of these days. Sometime this year would be nice, uh, but I do reckon we will see the return of Briefing Room. I keep saying it so far. We haven't heard anything, but if I say it long enough, then surely one day I'll be right. Anyway, with that said, that is it from me today. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please do consider subscribing. Also, come and hang out over at twitch.tv forward slash supermacbrother. You are all more than welcome, whether you're a veteran backer or a brand new backer with questions. Best place to ask your questions about Star Citizen. We are currently trying to play more of 317 and check out what it has to offer. Hit the thumbs up if you don't mind. It does do the channel a big favor. And tick that notification bell if you would like to be notified when my videos go live. Again, a huge thank you to my patrons and channel members for all of your support. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.